Welcome everyone again to today's webinar. From the chat box, I see that we have people joining us from all over. Welcome. Glad that you are um, spending time with us today. My name is Brittany Getch. I'm a program officer on the Knowledge Success Project at Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Knowledge Success is looking forward to this timely discussion on COVID-19 and AYSRH. Today, we'll be exploring data on the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on young people, stories of resilience and programming, and key lessons learned and best practices that can be applied to future emergencies. As you see on the slide, We'll start with setting the stage presentation, followed by a panel. We'll continue with a brief participant reflection and then end with a discuss discussion on program adaptations and lessons learned. Participants are muted throughout the duration of this conversation, but if you have questions for any one of our speakers, please type them in the chat box as you follow along. My Knowledge Success colleagues will be moderating the chat box and we'll get to as many questions as time allows during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. This conversation will last for approximately an hour and a half, and it is being simultaneously interpreted into French, as I mentioned. It's also being recorded in both English and French, and the recording will be available in the coming days. If you haven't already done so, please select your language by clicking the globe icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Just a reminder about closed captioning as well. You may select whether or not you'd like to read captions during the webinar by clicking the icon with the two C's at the bottom of the Zoom screen. To hide the captions later, click hide subtitle from the menu that appears. And should you have any trouble with either of these features during the webinar, please message myself or my colleagues, Cosette Bakai or Emily Haynes from Knowledge Success and we can assist you. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's conversation. Zaitwa Fabiano is a medical doctor with over three years working experience in clinical medicine and public health. She is a medical resident pursuing a Master of Medicine Internal Medicine at Witwatersrand University as a Mandela Rhodes Scholarship recipient. Zaitwa is the founder of a nonprofit organization called Health Access Initiative Malawi, which works to improve access to health information and services to the populace for positive health behavior change. She is a former youth lead ambassador, youth lead peer advisor, and 2019 Mandela Washington Fellow. She works to empower and mentor youth across the board. Zaitwa, welcome over to you. Hi, thank you, Brittany. <clears throat> and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's joined us from this web webinar across the globe. Uh, very excited to be here and very excited to have you all. Uh, Knowledge Access has uh, prepared this webinar today, which is going to be looking at uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly on the adolescent and youth uh, social reproductive health. As we all know, this pandemic has affected our lives in various ways, but also globally in terms of mental health and also physical health amongst many other things. There have been many webinars and discussions surrounding various issues, but today, uh, Knowledge Success has prepared this webinar to focus on um, this particular issue of youth and adolescent uh, sexual reproductive health. So as Brittany has already said, we're going to have five panelists from amazing, um, very reputable organizations. We have a panelist from FHI 360, another panelist from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, another from Girls Not Brides, and another from the International Association of Adolescent Health, and also from WHO World Health Organization. These panelists are a wealth of knowledge and they will be presenting to us their experiences and recent data in terms of the impact that the pandemic has had in terms of social, um, sexual reproductive health. So as we know, um, family planning programs have been impacted negatively, which has also led to unplanned pregnancies, um, negative um, or poor maternal health outcomes, school dropouts, amongst many other negative consequences. And that's what we'll be delving into today. 
following the five presentations, we're going to have a moderated discussion. So apart from coming in to receive the knowledge, coming in to receive experiences and this recent data, I also invite you to come ready to pose any questions to our panelists and they will be ready to tackle those questions but also share any recommendations that they have in terms, in terms of implementing positive change or positive um, impact in terms of um, adolescent youth um, sexual reproductive health. So um, those chats, uh, the chat will be open to questions, the chat will be open to comments, which Brittany and Cosette will be monitoring, and then we'll go on and discuss that later on. So our first speaker is Catherine Parker. She is a senior research associate working with FHI 360 in the Reproductive, Maternal, Newborn and Child Health Division. She has over a decade of global health experience and she's been working primarily in research projects and uh, research studies and programs which are related to sexual and reproductive health, family planning and also HIV. And she's been focusing primarily on adolescents and youth. So let's welcome her and let's, um, let's see what she has to share with us today. All right, thank you. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So I'm excited to share that Knowledge Success recently launched an interactive website called Connecting the Dots. And I believe the link will be dropped into the chat. Um, the point of this is to explore the impacts of COVID-19 on family planning in Africa and Asia. There are interactive charts that you can look at, as well as case studies of successful family planning program adaptations and key findings that we can apply to future crises. Today, I'm going to present a new sub-analysis that is grounded in connecting the dots, but pulls out the impacts of COVID-19 on young women's contraceptive use. Next slide, please. So to provide a little context, at the beginning of the pandemic in April 2020, UNFPA estimated that if COVID-19 related disruptions in health services continued for six months, seven million unintended pregnancies could occur. However, one year into the pandemic, UNFPA estimated that 1.4 million unintended pregnancies occurred, which indicates that the impacts of COVID-19 on unintended pregnancy during the first year of the pandemic may not have been as dire as originally feared. So these estimates inspired us to take a deep dive into the most recent evidence to try to understand what was going on. Next slide, please. So these are the main questions that we sought to answer. And I'd like to note that connecting the dots was not focused on youth. Um, but on the website, you can download data which are disaggregated by age, urban versus rural geography, and number of children. So today I'll present a new sub-analysis focused on young women, which attempts to answer the first two questions in this slide. Did pregnancy intentions or contraceptive use change due to COVID-19? Were women able to access family planning services during the pandemic? In the interest of time, I'm not going to present information on pregnancy desires, but I will note that they did not appear to change much due to COVID and generally did not differ among age groups. If you have questions about this or would like more information, I'm happy to talk about that later in the webinar. Next slide, please. So we worked with um, performance <laughs> PMA to analyze nationally or subnationally representative data from seven countries. In Cote d'Ivoire, Rajasthan, India, and Uganda, we analyzed data from one survey conducted six to eight months into the pandemic in those settings. In Burkina Faso, Kenya, Kinshasa DRC, and Lagos, Nigeria, we analyzed data from three surveys, one which took place just before before the pandemic started, usually December 2019 to January 2020. One earlier COVID survey, what we're calling it, um, three to four months into the pandemic, and then what we're calling a later COVID survey, eight to 10 months in. 
And I'd like to note that the earlier COVID survey was done by phone for COVID related reasons. And so the sample size was smaller as it only included those with access to phones. So this may impact the results. Next slide, please. This and the next two slides show data by age group. So the orange bar is younger women who are younger than 25. The light purple bar is women aged 25 to 34. And the turquoise bar is women aged 35 or older. Now I know this is a lot of bars, so focus your attention on the orange bars, which are the younger women. So if it's much higher or much lower, than the purple and blue bars, that means there's age differences. So this graph shows the percentage of women who are at risk of unintended pregnancy who were using contraception in the four settings that had multiple surveys. Overall, we found very little change in contraceptive use between surveys, which we found surprising. When we look at age differences, let's take an example. In Burkina Faso, contraceptive use actually slightly increased among younger women between the pre-pandemic and earlier COVID survey. So if you look at the bars on the far left and contraceptive use was slightly higher than pre-pandemic levels at the later survey. There's a similar pattern in Kinshasa and Kenya. However, in Lagos, Nigeria, younger women had lower contraceptive use at the later survey compared to older women and also compared to younger women at the earlier surveys. Next slide, please. Um, I think there's a problem with the slides because the earlier uh, and later COVID surveys are not showing up in the countries. Um, but so this one, um, we saw that contraceptive use overall did not change much, but what about contraceptive methods? Did women switch to less effective or no methods during the first year of the pandemic? Um, first note here that Lagos data are not shown because the age disaggregation was not possible for this indicator. Um, overall, fewer than one fifth of women in each setting changed to less effective or no method between surveys. However, there were slight increases in switching at the later COVID survey, potentially indicating a worsening situation. Looking at age, generally fewer or similar percentages of younger women compared to older women switched to less effective or no method. So just to let you know, the two bars on the left are Burkina Faso, the middle two are Kinshasa DRC, and the last two are Kenya. Next slide, please. This graph shows the percentage of women who were at risk of unintended pregnancy but not using contraception from all seven settings at the single or later COVID survey. Data from the earlier COVID survey were not able to be disaggregated because very few women gave COVID-related reasons for non-use. Overall, more women not using contraception cited COVID-related reasons for contraceptive non-use at the later surveys, which again suggests a worsening situation. Looking at differences in age groups, we see that in some settings, such as Lagos, more younger women than older women were not using contraception for COVID-related reasons, while in other settings, such as Kenya, the opposite was true. Next slide, please. So in summary, in this analysis, it appears that COVID-19's impacts on contraceptive use during the first year of the pandemic may not has been, have been as severe as originally feared. Generally, the impact on younger women was not worse. There were some age differences depending on the indicator, but they were not consistent across countries or even within a country across time points. One exception was younger women in Lagos, Nigeria at the later survey. Um, who had lower contraceptive use and higher non-use due to COVID-related reasons. So why might this be? I did not share this today, but in Connecting the Dots, we describe how program and policy adaptations contributed to continuing family planning services in the early phases of the pandemic, which enabled women to continue contraceptive use. So check out the website for more information, as well as key takeaways for future public health crises. And my last slide, I want to note several things here. So we note that the pandemic is still not over. 
The data we just shared are just from the first year of the pandemic from a limited number of countries, mostly in Africa. COVID-19 may have had and continue to have more severe effects on family planning services and use in other regions of the world or in other countries not included in the analysis. There were some indications that the COVID situation was worsening, such as more women not using contraception for COVID-related reasons in later surveys. In addition, we were not able to further disaggregate the data beyond the three age groups I shared for these indicators. You can disaggregate them further for PMA data for other analyses, but not for these specific indicators. Adolescents 15 to 19 can be very different from younger women ages 20 to 24. So differences between these age groups could potentially be masked. Um, so we need more data that can be disaggregated by age so we can identify the specific needs of adolescents and young people. So I look forward to seeing what the other speakers in this webinar present about impacts of COVID on youth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was very informative. And it really also calls um, or begs the question to say, you know, the problem with data collection during this pandemic has impacted the knowledge that we have and also implementation programs. So it'll be interesting to see um, what the other speakers do have, as you said. Uh, thank you very much for that. We will move on to the next panelist. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Asa, Asa Ramai, Ramia, sorry if I've butchered that. Um, she is a research associate from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She studies how culture and gender norms affect health outcomes and health behaviors amongst adolescents. She has a background in maternal and child health and she focuses on, a, on adolescent health and M&E. She has worked uh, for over nine years in Canada, Tanzania, Nepal, USA, and India in infectious disease, maternal health, and child health. She's a holder of a PhD from Drexel University and a master's from the London School of, Tropical, um, of, of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Asta Ramaya. Over to you. Thank you so much, Zaitwa, and uh, thank you to everyone who is attending. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Sorry for that. Um, as Zaitwa said, I am currently a research associate, but originally from Tanzania. So it is truly an honor to be presenting in front of such a diverse group. I have worked on this project collaboratively with uh, WHO, Rutgers, Population Council and um, and Gage. So, next slide, please. What we were looking to see is uh, we wanted to map and synthesize the literature on the impact of COVID nineteen pandemic on adolescents' health and social outcomes in low and middle income countries. The social outcomes that we focused on included social relationships, education, and disparities. Next slide, please. What we conducted was a rapid review of literature so that advocacy for attention to adolescent health and well being was based on a sound body of broad evidence and not a single site or anecdotal evidence, nor projections. We did not conduct a systematic review because it would be specific to one topic and entail a more rigorous quality assessment, which was not the objective of the assignment. For the, um, for the rapid review of literature, we looked through PubMed and Google Scholar, and uh, we also looked at some gray literature, which was focusing on adolescent specific research. For the inclusion criteria, we had articles in English published between December of 2019 and February of 2022, set in low and middle income countries and reporting original research. Next slide, please. So what did we find? 
we amassed a total of 90 articles that we coded and uh, created an annotated bibliography, which I would be happy to share if you need it. Um, what we found was 38% of the articles were set in Western Pacific, 62% were cross-sectional in nature, 74% were quantitative, and 62% were, were published in 2021. Next slide, please. So I have, um, we have divided the results into macro level, meso level, and micro level. So at the macro level, what we found was that um, there was worsening economic ramifications, widening gender disparities, and increased vulnerabilities for special populations. In the interest of time, I am going to be focusing on the worsening economic ramifications. What we found was that 60% of young people were worried about their family's economic future. And between 25 to 90% said one of their parents experienced income loss and approximately 80% reported worse household economic status compared to before the pandemic. This went hand in hand with household food insecurity, which was outlined in 41% of those articles. Within household food insecurity, adolescents reported skipping meals and, um, and staying hungry. Next slide, please. So this slide looks at the meso level implications. And um, what we found was there were impact on education, on family social relationships and peer social relationships. Both family social relationships and peer social relationships were predominantly negative, but I will be focusing on the piece of education. What we found is that within remote education, Articles describe the proportions that were enrolled in school during the pandemic, which ranged anywhere from 27% to 96%. However, articles also showed a significant decrease in those who were actively engaging in learning with proportions ranging up to 65%. What we found was that there was reduced future aspirations with, um, with most of the articles uh, focusing on early school living. Next slide, please. So this slide and the next slide are going to focus on the health implications of, um, of COVID-19. And in this slide, we see worsening mental health we see worsening uh, physical health, and we see ambivalent vaccine perceptions. I will focus on mental health. What we found is that prevalence of anxiety, stress, depression, and loneliness range from 4% to 75%. Risk factors for mental health included COVID-19 cases in the community, older age, being female, school closures, and negative family relationships. Protective factors for mental health included sleep and any amount of physical activity. Next slide, please. So this slide is focusing specifically on um, sexual and reproductive health outcomes amongst adolescents. We only found 16 articles that outlined SRH outcomes and half of these articles were published in 2021. What we found is that adolescents not accessing healthcare ranged up to 50%. Health services were not used due to COVID-19 stigma, access to health facility, and financial cost. Foregoing health services was higher amongst females in some of the articles. We also found that for menstruation, adolescent girls stated 
they had difficulty accessing menstrual products or maintaining menstrual hygiene. And although there have not been that many studies that look at the impact of SRH, the later part of 2021 and 2022 is showing indications of negative trends. A report from Kenya published by the Population Council showed that girls were dropping out of school to a greater extent than boys because they became pregnant. Next slide, please. And so um, this is my last slide. And uh, basically, I'm sorry, there is a lot of text. Um, it looks at the implications of what these results mean. I will highlight the first two boxes and the last two boxes, because that is what I have talked about in the presentation. We saw that all domains have been linked to worsening mental health. Therefore, we need to respond to mental health needs of adolescents, such as anxiety and depression, using evidence-based approaches, and also support parents to help their children and adolescents. Second, school closures have led to early school leaving and learning loss, highlighting the importance of keeping schools open, tailoring education to the needs of children, and continuing education for older adolescents who have started work. Third, we see that disparities have made marginalized adolescents vulnerable to the economic ramifications of the containment measures. We need to pay particular attention to the problems and needs of marginalized adolescents and advocate for attention to the factors that contribute to their marginalization. And lastly, SRH has been negatively affected, especially in terms of accessing routine healthcare and accessing menstrual products. There is a need to reduce COVID-19 stigma in order to ensure continuity of routine care, provide individualized care to vulnerable populations, and distribute menstrual products through the community in order to ensure menstrual equity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I see you focus quite a lot on the worsening economic instability and also um, uh, the poor mental and physical health and especially the menstrual health, which also led to school dropouts amongst those who had unplanned pregnancy, particularly of course in the girls. And that is a wonderful segue to the next presenter who is from um, Girls Not Brides. Um, this is the next speaker is Lara Van Kuterik. She is the head of learning and partnership development from Girls Not Brides, the global partnership to end child marriage. She has been working on women's and girls issues for most of her career. As an interim head of the partnership development, she leads the work of partnership team at Girls Not Brides, and she provides leadership and strategic oversight. Um, over their work to engage in its diverse and growing membership base and works to deepen and expand its work with the national par partnerships. She also ensures the development of a high performing and empowered partnership team. She holds a Master of Science in Cultural Anthropology and International Development Studies and she's very passionate about women's rights issues, movement building and developing effective partnerships for social change. So thank you. We look forward to hearing from you, Lara Van Kuter. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sayitwa. That's a very kind and generous introduction. Um, so I am going to talk uh, today about the impact of COVID-19 on child marriage specifically. Um, and as we already saw in the, the presentation from the previous speaker, um, uh, the, the, the pandemic has had a significant impact on, on child marriage. Um, I think most of you have heard of the term child marriage before, um, but for those who are less familiar with it, um, I'll just share a, a bit of general data um, on the issue. Um, so child marriage, um, as most of you might know, is any formal or informal union um, in which at least one of the parties under the age of 18. Um, Child marriage is a huge issue across across the globe. Uh, over 650 million women alive today were married before 18. Um, 
but we see uh, child marriage is uh, more prevalent um, in specific regions of the world. 34% uh, of girls married before 18 in Sub-Saharan Africa, 28% of girls in South Asia, and 22% in the Latin America and Caribbean. However, we know also that great progress has been made um, before the pandemic and continues to be made. Um, uh, child marriage is about 15% less common today than it was 10 years ago. Um, however, that progress has been very unequal um, and prevalence in lowest income countries is still double the global average. And within countries, there's huge disparities between um, richer and poorer households or communities. So, as I said, there has been a lot of progress in, in addressing child marriage or ending child marriage. And although um, not always um, uh, equally spread um, across the globe, um, a lot of steps have been made. Um, unfortunately, COVID-19 has, has impacted that progress. So if we look at the next slide, um, In 2021, UNICEF projected that um, the pandemic could lead to an additional 10 million girls marrying by 2030 due to the pandemic. Um, and this projection is taking into account um, specific um, indicators that, that affect child marriage. So it looks at school closures and the impact that has on girls' lives, um, the increased rates of adolescent pregnancy, um, as one of the previous speakers mentioned, and uh, the increased projections on that, um, but also disruption into SRHR care and specific child marriage prevention programming. Um, Economic shocks having an impact on household income and therefore the situation or the 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 the, the life the life opportunities for girls themselves, um, but also um, the death of parents or guardians as a result of the pandemic and the impact that has on adolescent girls. It's still too early to see any measurable change in child marriage prevalence. Um, and that is because of the way we measure child marriage. So we look at um, uh, women between 20 and 24, who are between 20 and 24 today and the age they were married at. So any impacts will only be uh, visible in the data in the next few years. But we do know from, from the data we've seen that uh, the pathways to which child marriage is likely to increase are, are already being, being documented. UNICEF also says um, in their report that um, um, we can turn the tide on, on these 10 million girls if we implement at scale uh, programming and investments that really ensure access to education, healthcare, and that protect against the, the impact of economic shocks. Um, if we do that, we could offset uh, uh, 5 million girls between now um, and 2030. I will now share a few examples of um, impacts or program adaptations or um, um, uh, effects that we have heard from Girls Not Brides members across the globe on the impact of COVID um, on girls. And some of these are through um, studies that CSOs have led or um, uh, briefs that we have produced together with Girls Not Brides members. If we move to the next slide. So together with Plan International, um, uh, Girls Not Brides looked at um, the impact of COVID-19 on child marriage in Western Central Africa specifically. Um, and this, uh, what you see here and what you can read in this brief is um, specifically based on observations from Girls Not Brides members, so civil society organizations on the ground. Um, so in what we've heard here is that, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, um, school closures were fueling an increase in sexual violence against adolescents. Um, our anti-child marriage coalition in Nigeria um, reported increases in um, rape, for example, in for adolescent girls, resulting in increased adolescent pregnancy and, and um, incidents of child marriage. 
Um, we also heard a lot of anecdotal evidence from girls in communities that they find it more difficult to access sexual and reproductive health care, um, lead it to increase in intended pregnancy, um, but also in um, more difficulty to access uh, postnatal care, so care for new mothers and babies. And you can see a quote there from an adolescent mother in Sierra Leone um, who was um, clearly struggling at that time. Secondly, I would like to share with you some examples from our um, members in Latin America and the Caribbean. So um, three Girls Not Rights members um, in Mexico um, did an observatory on gender and COVID-19 in Mexico specifically. And they found that the percentage of emergency calls related to domestic violence increased by 21% in 2020 compared to 2019, um, and 5% um, increase in instances of domestic violence. So there is a bit of a discrepancy between the, um, the data there, but it shows that um, maybe not all um, instances of domestic violence are officially reported, but that um, it it, yeah, it shows us that there was um, definitely a more unsafe situation for a lot of girls and women in, in their households. Um, we also saw um, that there was around 32% fewer abortions recorded in public hospitals in 2020. Um, and this was probably um, due to women and girls not accessing the services, um, so staying away from, from the services that they um, normally would have been able to access. So the Mexican National Population Council estimates that there would be an additional 20 and a half, 21 and a half thousand unwanted or unplanned pregnancy among adolescents between 15 and 19 year olds. Then thirdly, um, uh, I would like to share with you some examples from India. So this is a, a, a study that was conducted by Girls Not Rights Rajasthan, which is um, a coalition of civil society organizations working in Rajasthan, India. And in 2020, so quite early on in the pandemic, they conducted a study on the impact of, uh, on both married and unmarried women and girls, um, specifically in the lower income households. Um, what they found was that 89% of the respondents um, said that the pandemic had significantly impacted their household finances, um, really um, um, uh, leading to increased food insecurity, but also in tension to tension within the households and the community, um, and that often leading to uh, pressure for girls to marry or for pressure towards families to marry off their girls. Um, it also showed a significant impact on mental health, um, as, as the previous speaker was uh, talking about as well. 24% um, of the girls in the sample reported feeling either depressed or uh, worried, um, or really being um, worried about what opportunities they would have in, in their life due to the pandemic. Um, access to education was another um, a major impact that, that girls uh, were facing. Um, so virtually all girls stopped going to school during lockdown. And I think as some of you might know, lockdown lasted quite long in, in India and in some countries. Um, and although most of them stopped going to school, only 28% of girls were able to access either online classes, materials, or distance learning. Um, and a lot of girls expressed the worry that their parents had either lost interest in their education um, and that their, that was really having an impact on their life prospects. 90% of the girls um, expressed a fear of either getting married or um, being sent to their husband's house. Um, and 10% of girls reported witnessing cases of child marriage during the pandemic. So either one of their peers or someone in their family um, being married. Then if we move to the next slides, um, what, what did we learn about, about all of this or what are some of the, the key recommendations um, we should take on board uh, going forward? 
Um, so what we've seen from, from the different um, uh, reports shared here, but also from, from the, 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 the feedback that we are getting from Girls Not Rights members is that really investment in girls' education, sexual reproductive health care and psychological support are, are needed. Um, school closures and lack of access to education have had a massive impact on girls' lives. Um, but we also should recognize that SRHR care is essential in times of crisis um, and that we guarantee access for adolescent girls to these services regardless of their marital status. We've also seen that the, um, the needs of adolescent girls in responses to COVID, but also to other um, crises, um, should be really prioritized in strategies for either rebuilding or um, response, uh, emergency response uh, programs. And finally, um, what we have seen from Girls Not Rights members is that it has been particularly the community-based civil society organizations that work directly with girls that have been able to reach and work with girls during times of crisis. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, when there were harsh lockdowns in many countries, it was those community-based organizations that were continuing to provide services, um, provide support and really um, work with, with communities when, um, when, more, when, when services were no longer available. Um, so I think a key, key lesson we should learn from this is that it's those organizations that um, that's, are essential in times of crisis and they need to be funded and supported um, to do that work. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. Over to you, Zayitwa. Thank you very much, Lara. That was wonderful. Um, and that's a call to all the organizations who are here online that the work you're doing is fundamental, especially in um, reopening of schools and helping girls get back to schools. Um, Lara has talked a lot about child marriages and the disparity between um, different countries, but also differences between um, houses of various socioeconomic status, which has led to increased pregnancies and planned pregnancies, that is. And she's also given us a view from Nigeria where the increased cases of rape um, and planned pregnancies, and then also child marriages, difficult access to reproductive services, and also in Latin America, where there's a lot of um, reports of domestic violence, some which report, remain unreported, and in India, where married and unmarried women have had impact on their financial financial income in the homes, which has led to, to unplanned marriages. And she's also spoken a lot about um, the closure of schools. And this is a good segue again to the next speaker, Dr. Nicola Gray, who has worked with UNESCO regarding the safe reopening of schools during the COVID-19 pandemic. So she will give us an insight into the work that's being done there. Uh, Dr. Nicola Gray is the Vice President for Europe International Association for Adolescent Health. Um, she's also a senior lecturer in the pharmacy practice at the University of Huddersfield in the United Kingdom and an affiliated researcher within UNESCO Chair, um, WHO Collaborating Centre for Global Health and Education. She is a trustee of the UK Association for Young People's Health. And she's also the governing council member for the Global Coalition um, NCD Child and chairs the task force on essential medicines and equipment. So uh, we're excited to hear from you, Dr. Gray. Um, please share with us what you've prepared for us today. Over to you. Well, thank you so much, Saitwa. That's a lovely uh, introduction. Um, I wasn't, uh, my presentation today isn't about the safe reopening of schools as such, but it is a key theme throughout the pandemic and be very happy to answer any questions about that later. May I have the next slide, please? Well, I am the Vice President for Europe of the International Association for Adolescent Health. Let me tell you a bit more about it. Next slide, please. We are a coalition of national and regional organisations that are engaged in the issues of adolescent health and well-being. And we have a Vice President appointed in each of our nine world regions. And through our membership of clinicians, researchers, policymakers, and educators, 
We like to think that we're a, a radar scanning organisation for global and regional concerns. We have a vibrant young professionals network and we are the home of International Adolescent Health Week, which is a youth facing initiative for our clinician members to engage on interesting themes each March. And this year it was transitions. Next slide, please. In 2020, we were pleased to partner with a number of organisations that you can see here in a statement to protect adolescent health in the COVID-19 response. So this was fairly early in the pandemic, um, but we had already seen and, and, and read um, uh, concerns of major organisations about what was going to happen. And if we could just uh, hit the next slide, please. I'm choosing two issues here that came out of that statement um, that I'll talk about in the reflections I'm going to bring you from some of our vice presidents. The first one was the UNFPA projection that we've already heard about here about the additional, at this point, it was 13 million child marriages that they were fearing and 7 million unintended pregnancies. And next slide, please. We had a section and um, we'd split the statement into two sections. The first was for emergency actions and the second, you know, anticipated that there would be an, you know, a continuing situation for the pandemic. And this was to sustain and expand efforts as the pandemic evolves. And I think we've heard a lot about that today about, you know, we're still in a situation where we are living with COVID. What does that mean for access to quality information, products and services for adolescents and young adult women? And you can read that statement on our IAAH website if you wish. Next slide, please. So the first piece of reflection and intelligence relates to what I think is an incredibly important pillar um, relating to adolescent sexual and reproductive health, that of legislation. So hearing um, from uh, the, the other excellent presentations we've had about the challenge and the crisis in child marriage, um, Dr. Emma Lanto, who is our vice president in East Asia, was telling me about finally how the Philippines have passed two important, very important pieces of legislation, what they call Republic Acts. The first piece of legislation has been to increase the age of statutory rape from 12 to 16 years. And the second is to prohibit and penalize child marriage. And why is this so pertinent to the situation? Well, Emma reflects that about 70% of infants born to adolescent mothers in the Philippines are fathered by men who can be 20 years or more older um, than the adolescent mothers. So a real you know, challenge there. Uh, that one in six girls in the Philippines are married by age 18. And indeed, as we have heard, that the school closures and the family hardships um, that have come from the pandemic are risks for more child marriage. So here, just looking at legislation as a pillar to protect um, adolescent sexual and reproductive health. Next slide, please. The second pillar I'd like to look at and an example from Europe close to my home in the UK is about safeguarding of young people um, in their access to sexual and reproductive health services. Brooke is a massive um, sexual and reproductive health service provider in the UK and um, you can read one of their blogs on their website about their pre-pandemic plan to create a digital front door to their services. So recognising that telemedicine was an emerging opportunity to reach more adolescents, obviously the pandemic brought it into very sharp focus. So phase one of this digital front door has been around the development of an online sexually transmitted infection testing tool, a signposting tool and a staff hub because as they see it safeguarding is not an isolated intervention at a point in time but it is a core component of every interaction that their staff were having with young and or vulnerable people. Next slide please. So the challenges that they anticipated were of course with telemedicine they were losing that face-to-face -face interaction in the office that opportunity for clinical staff to exercise their professional curiosity 
looking at the body language of the young person in front of them, looking at who accompanies that young person to access services. They also anticipated a reluctance of clients to share their personal information while they were going through the telemedicine process. And so their strategies to counter this were to encourage those at risk to disclose it through very careful design of the system um, both using age appropriate design principles um, from our data protection office, um, but um, also to put things into the system where there were questions that would raise flags. And then when their staff logged into their online system to look at the list of clients awaiting their help, certain answers to certain questions would immediately show them as flags on the system that young person needed to be prioritised. And examples of those questions were if a young person was made to feel scared or uncomfortable by the person they were having sex with, if they were regularly using alcohol or drugs before they had sex, if they were generally feeling low or depressed, and if they were having sex with a significantly older partner. Next slide, please. So that was our safeguarding interventions, and it segues quite nicely into the third pillar of reflection that I bring to you today around workforce in adolescent sexual and reproductive health services. I'm grateful to Daisy Alamide and our colleague Tomiwa Owalabi. Um, our, Daisy is our Vice President for Sub-Saharan Africa, and they reported to us about this service in Nigeria. So Adolescence 360 there. Um, is a service that is implemented um, by the Society for Family Health in Nigeria. And um, the, the project there, the team knew that when the travel restrictions came in from the government in Nigeria, that young women would not be able to travel to their hubs of trained staff. And they saw from their service use data that weekly service use plummeted from 2,000 plus girls per week pre-pandemic to only reaching 250 girls a week in April 2020, which was still a valiant effort, but they knew, next slide please, that they needed to act fast, as the project director said. And so a network of connected health workers kept young women in touch with counsellors. And there were two strategies that they used. Next slide, please. The first strategy on the left, was to keep their workers up to date, to train them by text and video, to make sure that they had information about COVID-19 infection integrated into their messaging um, and to uh, you know, keep the staff connected to the centre about um, what, were, what the situation was. And then that translated into the communities to still having mobilised people there who could stand, yes, wearing PPE, six feet away from the girls, socially distanced, but able to take those initial concerns from girls still near to their homes and in their communities. And then if they needed to, being able to refer those young women with their consent to the trained staff in the hubs who would then connect with them through phone or through text, um, but those community health workers made the difference right there in the communities. Next slide, please. You can read more about that at the A360 Learning Hub. So I think that some of the cross-cutting themes that come out of that about resilience for services in the pandemic are to empower the people who serve and work with adolescents and young adults, making sure that they can identify and prioritise those most at risk, the importance of having accurate data about service use and monitoring the situation, the potential to harness that digital technology, but the need to retain human contact. Thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Gray. And you have brought up a very important issue, the issue of telemedicine. Uh, technology has come to the forefront during the pandemic in terms of communication, basic human interaction and accessing social services. And she has highlighted um, this project, Adolescent 360 in Nigeria and the pros and cons of telemedicine. So thank you very much for bringing that forward. And she's talked about resilience and adapting during the pandemic. Um, 
So any questions, comments, continue posting them in the chat and the links which are being mentioned are also being posted in the chat. So keep an eye out for that. Um, our last panelist today is Ahmed Ali. Um, Ahmed Ali is an Egyptian physician, um, a public health professional and researcher. And he has 10 years working in sexual and reproductive health programs. He has a master of public health from the American University of Beirut. And he has served as a research fellow at the Faculty of Health Sciences and a medical education fellow at the Faculty of Medicine at the American University of Beirut. His most recent project involves exploring um, the use of gender transformative approaches in humanitarian settings, mapping and developing SRH professional social and behavioral competencies, assessment of intergenerational communication among about SRH, HR, SRH topics, integration of HR, HR services into primary healthcare and the impact of COVID-19 on accessing those SRH services. And currently he serves as an adolescent sexual reproductive health and rights consultant at the World Health Organization. We look forward to hearing from you as well. Over to you, Ahmed Ali. Thank you, Zaitova. Uh, this was a nice introduction. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I would like to take this time uh, in order to go uh, through some of the lessons learned that we uh, synthesized from the findings of our case studies that we assembled from uh, 36 uh, organizations that came from 16 countries. Uh, the findings of this presentation shall actually build on the previous presentation. Uh, in terms of what kind of responses that were out there, especially at the early time of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So this started by, uh, at the early time of the pandemic, we had little information. Organizations tried as much as possible to collect data uh, in order to reshift the focus on adolescent sexual reproductive health uh, governments had different priorities that focused on uh, alleviating the economic burden, uh, discussing concerns and addressing concerns about unemployment, food and shelter, among others as well. So it was up to different organizations, local and international, in order to uh, reframe the focus on adolescent sexual reproductive health. In this specific activity, uh, it started by the development of a technical brief that WHO and UNFPA developed in order to provide some guidance for healthcare providers and workers in order how, uh, to learn how could they adapt the delivery of SRH interventions, especially in the, the light of the uh, abrupt disruptions of access into services. So these guidance were provided uh, in uh, a lot of components of the adolescent sexual reproductive health services, uh, including uh, access to contraception, including HIV care, uh, prepartum and postpartum care, and others as well. Next slide, please. So the guidance draw lessons from uh, 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 lessons from the interventions have been done in humanitarian settings, uh, different or similar con context similar to the one that could help in uh, uh, in providing responses during the pandemic. Our question was to learn the adaptations uh, of SRH responses during the pandemic. And in order to do that, uh, we issued a call uh, that was not open to individual organizations, but more specifically to the WHO and the UNFPA regional offices in order to solicit from them some case studies uh, in order to learn what is, our, what is happening out there in terms of the responses. And then we engaged two researchers in order to gather those data. Uh, and then we followed this up with uh, the analysis that is still ongoing. Next slide, please. So I will provide you now with some of the findings that we have uh, uh, analyzed from the case studies data. Uh, as we mentioned, there were 36 case studies came from 16 countries, but they were mostly from Africa and Southeast Asia. 
they cover different contexts as well within those uh, continents. Uh, we try to cover the same services that the technical were based on the technical brief uh, in order to learn uh, the full scope of the services provided and how were they, they were adapted. So you see here that we tried again to 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 learn about what happened in the contraceptive and for access to contraception and uh, information, ministerial health information and products, access to HIV care, and of course, care for gender-based violence. We had also two or three examples that covered HPV vaccination during the pandemic. These responses mostly targeted adolescent girls, but also targeted the most vulnerable uh, adolescents as well. So it might, it's not mentioned here, but many of those interventions targeted adolescents living with HIV, uh, LGBTQ uh, adolescents, uh, adolescents who are living in remote areas or do not have access to the internet, which was a, a concern that most of these adaptations uh, were based on digital or remote services. So the reach or outreach also was an important component of some of these responses. And of course, also school-based uh, programs targeted some uh, the school-going students. Uh, during the pandemic and the disruptions, uh, programs try to reach those students uh, in other areas, basically their homes, using some of the uh, remote uh, and outreach services. Next slide, please. So the mode of the delivery of the services was mostly digital or remote based services. They were either provided on their own as a substitute for the facility based service or as a, in a combination with some facility based services, which were adapted at the time uh, to comply with the protocol uh, for providing services or face to face services. Uh, uh, while uh, using protection equipment or personal protection equipment, while doing infection control measures, while using social distancing, uh, according to the status of the pandemic at the specific setting. So if there was lockdown, if there was uh, 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 modified hours, if there were shift-based services, all of these were taken in consideration. And of course, one of the components was how to communicate the change of the, the changes in the delivery of the services to uh, adolescents and the, the larger communities as well. As they were mostly digital, it, it was only natural to learn that they are actually uh, a heavy use of uh, telemedicine. This is something that was discussed by the previous presentation or tele telehealth, mobile health applications, phone consultations, uh, even a referral for services using hotlines and health, and uh, health lines. And of course, uh, one of, of the examples was the use of the e-pharmacies to provide some commodities or, or ASRH commodities to adolescents while trying to maintain confidentiality and privacy as well. Uh, so the next part of the findings, which is the reasons behind these adaptations, can tell us more about why these responses existed. And in, the, in that regard, uh, the, the first uh, reason was largely to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the access to the SRH services. So to try to resume the services that were actually provided prior to the pandemic. But also because of the pandemic, it brought attention to two uh, other issues. So prior to the pandemic, there were some gaps in the services, some organizations uh, try to bridge those gaps because they were f they feared the an aggravated impact by the COVID-19 or the pandemic or the lockdown or other other uh, effects of the pandemic and also a compounded effect that could happen to the most vulnerable adolescents. So they prioritized the reach or their reach to those target groups. Next slide, please. We also tried to learn as much as possible in that early phase of the pandemic, how uh, they were able to collect data, if they were able to, and what is the kind of the data that they were able to do that. Of course, there were at the time no evaluation data provided, but there were some monitoring and follow-up data that built on existing uh, data collection mechanism or adapted from, from that. 
and most of the data were process related so they find that they try to include data of reach uh, uh, coverage of services and also satisfaction of uh, service beneficiaries uh, next slide please maybe also next slide So because of the time, I will try to highlight just one example that happened in Uganda. So in that example, uh, where the, uh, UNFPA partnered with an entity, which is a private entity uh, called Safe Poda, which is, is a something similar to Uber apps, uh, but it's more uh, of a motorcycle taxi app. And that uh, previous to the pandemic, they tried to partner with this initiative in order to uh, increase the safety and you know address some concerns about uh, gender-based violence. So this was a safe way for transportation for adolescents in general. But in that regard, they tried to, after the pandemic, design an e-pharmacy or a personal health pharmacy that is uh, became a component of the Safe Poda app. So now adolescents can order health commodities, even uh, some commodities that were available for free by the Ministry of Health, and these commodities were delivered free of charge. Pharmacies were included in that, uh, and they were built up on uh, until they reached 10 pharmacies uh, on that app. And again, uh, the customer service were trained on how to respond to adolescent health uh, or ASRH concerns. And of course, also there was the element of privacy and confidentiality in that regard. So this was one example. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, my last slide. And just to discuss the implications for uh, our follow-up on this uh, case studies. Uh, we learned from these case studies that there are adaptations that could be used uh, to complement or maybe substitute traditional programming. But this is, of course, still bending uh, more rigorous studies to the, discuss their, uh, the evaluation of their outcomes and how they could help uh, the larger base of evidence regarding interventions. But also, uh, they were not uh, strict, strictly uh, digital interventions. Some of them were just simple adaptations that could lend themselves into other humanitarian contexts. And this could be a, a great part of the lessons learned from uh, this uh, uh, study. And we actually plan, uh, because of the nature of the study and after the first wave, to, to carry out a second wave in order to learn exactly uh, about the scope of these interventions during the previous 18 months, where they expanded upon, where they changed or modified, if they were also evaluated, and what would, what would be the results of these evaluations. Thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for that. For sharing the data from Africa and Southeast Asia, and also bringing up um, uh, the LGBTQ adolescents and also the adolescents from the rural areas who may have had challenges accessing the digital services which were being provided, and for highlighting the challenges in data collection, but also the adaptations that were made. Uh, that was very informative. And one last big thank you to all the speakers. Um, the presentations were very informative. We've learned a lot, and they were also very stimulating. So we're going to um, go on to the moderated discussion now. The floor is open. We've been reviewing the questions and the comments you've been posting. And also note that resources are being posted in the chat. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's a question from Sanjita. Um, this is a question for Dr. Asma, uh, As Asta, sorry, Dr. Asta. She's asking about um, suicidal ideation. May you please expand on that? Absolutely. Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much for the thank you so much for the question, Sanjita. And um, just um, I think in a seven minute presentation, we can't cover everything. So uh, definitely, basically, suicidal ideation and attempts um, ranged anywhere from 10 percent to 36 percent. And these were outlined in uh, two settings. Suicidal ideation specifically was only outlined in one study, and that study was in China. 
And what they did in that study is they took two groups of adolescents, one who were uh, left behind children who were um, categorized as marginalized and one group who were non, not left behind children who were categorized as non-marginalized. And uh, what we found was that suicidal ideation amongst that population was 36%. And um, factors that were associated with higher suicidal ideation included uh, lower parental education, higher anxious sim symptoms, and higher depressive symptoms. Among those who were marginalized, factors associated with suicidal ideation included being female, lower parent education, worse perceived family economic status, anxiety symptoms, and depressive symptoms. Does that answer your question? All right, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Asba. Perhaps um, this, uh, the person who offered the question will comment in the chat. Um, perhaps we can proceed to the next question, which is for um, Catherine. This question is from Amy. Um, it's, it's a bit long, so I'll read through. Uh, may you please offer potential reasoning why PMA data indicating a minimal drop in contraceptive use among young women reconciles with the literature indicating increased rates of adolescent pregnancy and CEFMU as offered by other presenters. You noted the inability to offer to, uh, to further disintegrate the age data to 15 to 19 year olds, yet the overall range of 25 and younger did not change much. Could it be say that PMA data collection might offer those who are already who are already contraceptive users, or that it may struggle to reach adolescents in a safe manner for data collection, or that the timing of data collection eight to ten months into the pandemic was not long enough to illustrate the increase to adolescent pregnancies? Do these PMA findings align with other national or global data collection findings? Great, thank you for all those great questions. So for the PMA indicators I presented, the denominator was women at risk of unintended pregnancy. And this was defined as non-pregnant, non-infertile, married or partnered women who did not want to have a child within the next year. So fewer adolescents age 15 to 19 met these criteria, especially due to the married partnered criterion. And this is what they used as a proxy for recent sexual activity. So for this particular analysis, it was more limited for age, but these are uh, nationally and subnationally representative samples. So, you know, for other indicators, if you're not limiting it down to people with partners, um, you could look at women aged, adolescents age 15 to 19. Related to your other questions, um, we actually had similar findings to a recent FP2030 report. Um, and they analyzed a lot of different data, including Track 20 data for six sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and HMIS data uh, showed higher than expected increases in contraceptive use in four countries and slight decreases in two countries, but overall not much change. Um, and Guttmacher data from public and private sectors in Ethiopia and Uganda from March 2020 to December 2020 also showed very little decline in adolescents' contraceptive use. And for Uganda, it actually increased above pre-pandemic levels after initial, an initial decline. So in sum, available data are still limited, but you know, consistently indicating that the disruptions and shutdowns of the pandemic have had less impact on women's sexual and reproductive health than initially expected, but more severe impacts may not yet be showing up in the data. Um, so we do have to wait to understand the impacts better. Um, so I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, if we can just call upon the panelists uh, one more time, uh, we'd just like to ask you two questions. Uh, perhaps we could go from the first speaker from FHI 360 to the last speaker from WHO. Um, if you could just uh, give us two recommendations for immediate action to mitigate the crisis, 
and also two recommendations uh, where policymakers and program implementers uh, should take note, especially with regards to emergency uh, preparedness and response. So perhaps if we could begin with you. Great, I'll try to keep this short. So I do wanna take a moment to celebrate the successes that programs have had in continuing to provide critical contraceptive services. And I loved um, you know, the WHO presentation on documenting those and other projects are doing that. So continuing to have webinars and other uh, learning sessions so we can share what has actually successfully uh, worked in terms of program adaptations um, and you know, apply those to other settings. Um, I'd also say for groups designing surveys, you know, proactively designing data collection tools and methods to capture youth experiences and be able to separate data enough to examine differences among subgroups of youth. Um, and in the longer term, I think we've seen today through all the presentations, we can't forget that health and education are inextricably linked. Um, and it would be awesome to do more things like looking at data to show the impacts of mental health on contraceptive youth. I mean, sorry, contraceptive use among youth and other interesting links that are exacerbated in a pandemic. So I will leave it at that and let the other panelists speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may we please hear from the speaker from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. That's me? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, no. Um, so I just wanted to revise the question that you asked. Uh, basically, you're saying, where do we take these findings and what do we do with them, right? In a nutshell, yes. Okay, so um, my last uh, my last slide, and again, of course, uh, my results were very much um, very much based on what I found in the literature, you know. And so this is not original research, but um, what um, what I would what I would recommend is that um, one. Um, I think it is important that um, what and what I highlighted in my results was that um, the economic ramifications have uh, particularly had um, have particularly been adverse for the most marginalized um, adolescents, and we we see that there is a link there is a link between um, between the between the macro level macro level impact the meso level impact as well as the micro level impact you know and so what we need to think about is rather than doing focused um going into a silo and doing interventions at just the individual level i think we need to recognize the fact that the pandemic has estimated the marginalization of those who were already marginalized you know and this has been particularly strong for those who were poor those who are girls those who are uh, from a uh, lower socioeconomic status. And so I think in our next step and when trying to think about future pandemics, I think we need to keep those inequities in mind and think about ways in order to reduce those inequities. Thank you very much. Um, and then over to you, uh, Lara Van Kuterik. I'll just repeat the questions. Uh, the first is two recommendations for immediate action to mitigate the crisis, and two recommendations where policymakers and program implementers should take note, especially with regards to emergency preparedness and response. So over to you, Lara Van Kuterik. Thank you. Um, first of all, just to say, I completely agree with um, what Asta was just saying. Um, but going back to, to your first question on um, sort of immediate, uh, shorter term um, uh, recommendations, um, I think from what we have seen is that um, the return to school for girls is 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 essential, and and um, girls have dropped out of school um, a lot, and not everybody has been able to return to school even post lockdown or um, post um, restrictions being lifted. So um, the return to school and and really. Um, 
um, making sure that uh, or guarantee 13 years of education for every every child is essential. Um, and as I was saying, I also I completely agree with what Asta was just just saying because what we have seen specifically is that that an a crisis like like COVID-19 is particularly impacting those who are already at risk um, of child marriage or those who are already most uh, marginalized. Um, and I think really looking at, at the, the, the multiple and intersectional um, oppressions that girls face, um, um, especially when they're from lower socioeconomic status or, or background, um, and making sure that, that the rights and, the, and the, the needs of those girls or adolescents are prioritized in even in times of crisis is essential. Um, I think in, in terms of long-term, like emergency um, preparedness and response, um, um, for us, what, what is really important is that, that, that policymakers really look at upholding the, the human rights in times of crisis. So that means prioritizing the needs of girls, including um, continuation of access to essential care, SOHR care and education. Um, but also really consulting girls and women during the full cycle of um, emergency preparedness, risk mitigation and response, and making sure that, that we design interventions um, that are effective and, and, and targeting uh, women and girls in particularly. Um, and I think a second sort of more longer term recommendation from our side would be that what we have seen throughout the pandemic is that it is the community-based organizations that are able to continue work during times of crisis. So um, making sure that they have the resources, that they're well-funded um, and that they are able to, um, to innovate as they have been doing during the crisis to, um, to continue the, the service delivery, education, et cetera, social support to girls is essential. So yeah, for me, a big plea would be to um, increase funding for, for civil society and community-based organizations. Um, particularly during times of crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nicola Gray. Thanks very much. Well, I consulted again with my vice presidents who brought you those examples and here are our two immediate actions. Um, we wanted to um, pick up that point of empowering and informing local health workers, you know, whether they're uh, health sector or um, civil society sector who are there in communities to make sure no woman is cut off from services. And we particularly wanted to bring out the situation for adolescent girls and young married women who are in refugee camps, who are in host communities, who are in conflict zones, you know, that the pandemic and conflicts uh, are just, um, you know, the, the, it's the perfect storm. Um, so we wanted to bring that out. And secondly, I wanted to say, think carefully about the design and the framework around telemedicine services. I think there's a real um, assumption that can be made that, you know, this is the way forward, you know, that, uh, and, and to take some of the human factors out of that. And, um, and so I think that the frameworks have to be robust in terms of consent and confidentiality and safeguarding, as we highlighted. And one of the best ways to do this will be to involve uh, adolescents and young adults to find those best methods to make sure they're involved in the design of services that affect them. The longer term recommendations, interestingly, um, Daisy in um, Nigeria was telling me about the involvement of parents and she felt it was particularly important that we, uh, you know, really make an effort with parents because the young girls that they're seeing coming to their services are um, brought to clinic by their parents. Their access to the internet is via their parents' phones and they rely on their parents' judgment. So especially for the youngest girls that, you know, that, that uh, you know, think not, keep, not putting parents out of the equation will be important. And the second one, coming back to the work in schools, is to try and find deeper collaborations between health workers and their local schools. And again, this might uh, extend the reach to especially younger adolescent women who don't have the confidence, the resources um, of, uh, of, of, of older uh, young women and, and who would appreciate having this non-stigmatised, you know, that the services are coming to them in school and empowering them there. Thank you, Dr. Gray. May we hear from Ahmed? Thank you so much. Uh, I will try to be brief as possible. 
Uh, so for the short term actions, I think we still need to continue working on uh, sharing and learning these lessons learned that could help different organizations and stakeholders in order to respond to mitigate the impact of COVID on ASRH service disruption or to accentuate their programming or strengthen them with the different uh, adaptations that could be done to their, their programs and also prioritize uh, reaching the most vulnerable uh, young people, showing examples and showing something that they can help uh, either replicate or adapt or modify uh, in order to uh, uh, not to leave any adolescent behind. Uh, and, and to continue collecting data in order to learn about the uh, longer term impact of these adaptations and uh, uh, with more rigorous uh, studies as well. For me, the longer term uh, or the ongoing, let's say, uh, uh, recommendation uh, is to enable uh, better and efficient platforms for stakeholders and partnerships in order to advocate the different governments and again the stakeholders about the impact of COVID-19 using clear and concise messages, messages that uh, we have now more evidence in order to develop these messages, messages and, and hopefully we will be able to have some consensus between the partners on those messages in order to have a clear focus on adolescent sexual reproductive health programming. Uh, among the governments and the institutes, donors and other stakeholders as well. Uh, basically, in order to uh, maintain the progress on adolescent sexual reproductive health programming and not to allow COVID to reverse the gains that happened in the two previous decades in adolescent programming. Thank you so much and over to you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, so our recommendations have ranged from um, data collection adaptation um, in terms of the tools to always keep in mind that health and education are linked, but also that it's very important for girls to return to school and to keep in mind that more or not all of them have returned back to school. And COVID-19 is particularly affecting the marginalized populations and that girls and women need to be consulted when we're preparing for these um, emergency measures. And telemedicine is very important. It's played a vital role. Parents should be involved um, and that we need to share the lessons that have been learned as we're doing today. And also that more studies are needed and we need better platforms for stakeholders and partners. So thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you very much for the questions and comments from the audience. Um, and also just note that there are links which have been posted in the chat for resources. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Brittany. Great. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I want to thank everyone for that engaged and thoughtful discussion on the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on young people and these important lessons learned um, from this resilient programming um, that can be applied to future emergencies. We've gained so many great insights, as Aithwa was saying, um, from the experiences that were shared today. Thank you again to our moderator and our speakers for joining us and to you all for your great questions. Just a reminder that we'll be posting and sending out a recording of today's webinar in both English and French. Um, we also encourage you to follow um, Knowledge Success as well as all of the organizations that joined us today at the social media handles that you see here to stay up to date on resources, activities, and upcoming events. Um, we also hope that you will check out our FP Insight platform. Um, FP Insight is the first resource discovery and curation tool built for and by FPRH professionals. And as you'll see on the screen, these are just some of the features of FP Insight. It's available in 21 languages. It has a personalized news feed and offline viewing. You also see on the slide a link to the specific collection that we've created for this webinar to be able to share resources with anyone who has an FP Insight profile. FP Insight is free and openly accessible to the public. Um, this link will also be added to the chat box if you'd like to follow that. You'll be prompted to create an FP Insight profile to access the collection or to sign in to an existing account. Again, thank you all so much for joining us today for this great conversation um, and be sure to look out for the webinar recordings and recap that will be shared shortly. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone.